Hebrews chapter 11. We will be looking at Hebrews 13, and I will go ahead and tell you that we'll have several other references, and so if you want to, uh, those, many of those references will be on the screen, but if you want to look them up and write, them, you know, write that reference down later, you can. Um, but if you have your connection there, your handouts, there's a question that was asked on that handout, and this is the question. When reflecting on your spiritual life, what would you be say that you would be known for? When reflecting on your spiritual life, what are you known for? And you can write something down in that blank. And to rephrase this on a broader terms, when you look at your life, spiritually, religiously, uh, you know, morals, what would people say about you? Uh, would you be known as someone who is kind? Uh, would you say that you're a person of prayer? Would you say that you are known for your love, that you are friendly, that you have good morals, that you have good character, that people that know you would say this person is loyal? What would you say that you would be known for? And I want you to write that down. Now, all those things are good. Um, and you might be here today and you might be honest and I appreciate your honesty and you might say, Craig, I really don't have any kind of spiritual life and so I don't have anything to write down. Uh, maybe I'm a good person, but I really don't have any kind of spiritual connection. If that's you, I do appreciate your honesty. We'll get back to that here in just a, a couple of minutes. Now, there's a lot of good choices that we could write down, but, but I believe and I would argue that, that one of the most defining things that we should be known for is our faith. It's our faith. Strong, unshakable, unwavering faith. Hebrews 11 gives us a definition of that faith. This is what it says. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not Seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. The Oxford Dictionary would define it this way. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, all of us put our confidence in our faith and our trust in something or someone. You might be here this morning and you might say, Craig, I'm not a spiritual person, but that doesn't mean that you do not put confidence and trust in something or someone. We all put our faith and our trust in something or someone. It might be your health. It might be your job. It might be your family. It might be your friends. It might be that your grandparents were Christians. But all of us put our hope in something. Now, for most of us, I think ultimately, again, I'm talking here to those of you that would consider yourself Christians, that you have given your life to Jesus, that you have been saved, that there's been a time in your life that you put your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. And if that's not you, then we'll, we'll, we will come back to that because I believe that today could change your life forever. If you're here, you're not a Christian. There's no question about it. But for many of us that are here, I would imagine that most of you would say that your ultimate faith is in Jesus Christ, that your confidence lies with Jesus and how he has changed your life. If we had three chairs that were setting up here this morning, and the first chair said family, and the second chair said job, and the third chair said God, I would imagine a lot of people are going to stand up, and I was to say, I want you to sit in the chair that represents where your confidence is. I think that a lot, if not most, would come over and sit in the chair labeled God. I think some of you, if you're honest, you would come over and you sit in the chair that said family, and some of you might come and sit in the chair that said job. But for a lot of us, we would say that our faith, our confidence, our trust is in Jesus Christ. 
So my question to ask us today is this. The Bible is very, very clear that we need to be known, we need to be marked as men and women of great faith. And that goes for all of us. If you're a teen here and you're a Christian, then you need to be marked as someone that has great faith. And so if we are supposed to be people that are known by our faith, then how do we get from that knowledge of faith to make it a part of our life? Because I I do believe that there are some that would say, Craig, I, I want to be known for my faith, but if I was to be honest, I struggle with my faith. If I was to be honest, people would not look at me and say, that's a person of faith. They might look at me and say, that's a person who worries, that's a person that, that is kind, whatever that might look like. But I want to be a person of faith. I want to live out my faith in a great and mighty way. And if that's you, I think it's all of us, how do we go from knowledge to living that faith out in a great way to the point that we are known as people of great faith. How do we do that? Well, one of the things that we can do is we can look at examples. Again, if I were to ask you to think of people in your life that, that you know represent faith to you, like when, when I say who's someone that just is known for their faith, you have somebody in your mind. It might be a parent might be a grandparent, might be a pastor, might be a friend, a cousin, aunt, uncle, whatever that looked like. And you have that person in your mind. You might be here and you might say, no one in my family, that's no one. I would encourage you today that can change. You can change the trajectory of your family. But we can look back at examples. A couple of chapters over Hebrews 11, this is what it says. The author says, remembering those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, what is the scripture saying here? It's saying this, that remember those people who lived a life of faith and do what they did. Remember how they lived their life, how they conducted themselves, and live a life similar to that. If you've been in Life University, we've walked through 2 Timothy here in the worship center on Sunday nights. And one of the things that's defining in 2 Timothy is Paul, the author of this letter to a young pastor in his 30s, Timothy, is telling Timothy, again, I don't have it all figured out, I'm not perfect, but Timothy, you live the life that I've taught you, that you see how I live my life and I want you to conduct yourself in similar ways. So if we want to become people of not just knowledge of faith, but living out our faith, again, one of the ways that we can do that is through the examples that we have in scripture and in history as well. And so today I I want to look back at a man that was known for his faith. And I want to tell his story, and I believe that when we look at his life through the lens of Scripture, that we are going to see that he lived his life and was known as a person of great faith. Because again, I do believe that the majority, if not all of us, could raise our hand and say, I want to be known as a person of great faith. And I will be the first to tell you there's been times in my life where I know for a fact I'm not known as a person of great faith, but I want my faith increased. Let's pray this morning and we'll jump in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the word. And so, Lord, I just pray again that our hearts will be focused on you. Change our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A man known for his incredible faith was George Mueller. In fact, he was a man known... For his faith, who God gave millions, and by millions, I mean millions of dollars, to do ministry. A man known for his incredible faith is George Mueller. Some of you have heard of George Mueller. Many of you have not. 
So I'm going to give you a little background of his life. 93 years in about four minutes, all right? Simply though, this is, this is what it comes down to. George Mueller was known as a man of great faith. And he put into action what he believed. He was born September 27th, 1805 in Germany. His dad was a tax collector. He's lost his mom when he was 14. George Mueller in his early days, was not known for living a very moral life. In fact, he was known as a gambler, as a liar, as a thief, as a, 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 a drunkard. He was thrown into jail. He stole from his dad. It's about as low as you can get, honestly, until you find out that when he was 14, his mom died. He was out drunk, and he had no idea that his mom died. So the early years of George Mueller were not marked by anything of good value for being honest with ourselves today. When he went to college, his dad wanted him to get a good degree, a degree so he could be set up financially for life. 1825, he was in college, and a friend of his invited him to a Bible study. And it was at that Bible study that Jesus would radically change George Mueller's life and he would give his life to Jesus Christ. One year later, he would surrender to become a missionary. And he would say that his chief passion for life and ministry was this, and I quote, to live a life and lead a ministry in a way that proves God is real, God is trustworthy, and God answers prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to lead a life that proves that God is real, God is trustworthy, and he answers prayer. Amen. That's one of the great things that could be said about somebody. Not that they had a bunch of hobbies, not that they had a bunch of trinkets of this world, although those things are gifts. Again, those are, are, are good things, but I can't think of a greater thing that could be said than that, that somebody lived a life that showed that God was real, he was trustworthy, and he answered prayer. That was George Mueller's goal in life. 1830, he would get married. 1832, he and his family would move to Bristol in England where he led two churches. 1835, he would have a burden to start an orphanage. In fact, it was Charles Dickens that would write, and because of his writings would focus on the, the, the crisis going on in England of that time of all the children that lived in the streets. Because of sickness, because of a number of things, children were forced into workhouses. They lived on the streets. And this caused George Mueller to realize that immediate action needed to take place. 1835, he would call a public meeting with a view to open up an orphanage home. He saw a need. Now, this was a step of faith for George Mueller. The verse that really sort of confirmed all this was found in Psalm 81.10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. When George Mueller started his orphanage there, the children's homes, his main concern was to show that God would provide, that he would always come through, that prayer and faith were the defining characteristic of these homes. 1836, the first home would be opened up. 1837, a third home. He would never take any kind of, of, of a salary he always stepped out in faith. He would not build another home until the money was provided. 1870, the fifth house was complete. And by the time it was all said and done, George Mueller had built five large houses and cared for over 10,000 children. In fact, one of the great effects of his ministry was that it affected other people. And one of his biographers said that 50 years after he began his work, 
at least 100,000 orphans were cared for in England alone because people caught the vision that he had. 1894, his second wife would pass away. His daughter would pass away shortly after that. In 1898, at the age of 92, he would pass and go home to where he was meant to be at his house in Bristol, England, would go home to be with his Savior. At his funeral, 1,500 orphans that could walk, the distance walked in the procession, and over 7,000 people would come to the cemetery to honor the life of George Mueller. Now you might say, Craig, what does that have to do with me? I'm not going to England. I have no plans on opening up any kind of a house. Like, I don't know what that has to do with me at all. But I would argue that it has everything to do with you and I. Because George Mueller was simply a man who lived a life of faith. He was no different than you and I. Now, the setting might be different. Again, 1800s, England, 2024, right here, Raleigh, North Carolina, the setting is certainly different. But the story is the same. George Mueller lived a life of great faith. Second Corinthians says this, so we are always confident, knowing that while we were at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We need to be marked as people who walk by faith, not by sight. So how do we do that? How do we get there? How do we progress in our life? Four things that I want us to look at. Number one is this. Living a life of faith requires a focus on prayer. Living a life of faith requires a focus on prayer. Living a life of faith requires a consistent prayer life. Being a Christian and having prayer consistently go hand in hand. It is one of the most important aspects of our life as followers of Jesus. It is something that aligns us with God's heart. And I would argue that if we want our faith to increase, if we want our faith to grow strong, prayer needs to be a part of that. And I don't know about you, but I want my faith to increase. This is what it says in Luke. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. <clears throat> Increasing our faith requires trusting in the Lord, obeying him in all circumstances. Listen, when we pray, we are inviting God into our lives and we're asking for guidance. And I don't know about you, but I need God's guidance in my life every day. My fear is there are a lot of people that they look for their guidance in their friends or they look for their guidance in social media or there are some that look for their guidance in the news. And I can tell you that if I'm looking for my guidance in social media or I'm looking for my guidance in the news, I am going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Prayer keeps us close to God. It opens up our hearts to him. It helps us grow. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Paul says in Philippians chapter four, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Prayer is important because it is petitions us to receive God's peace that surpasses all understanding. We need to be people of prayer. George Mueller would say this, and I know and I would say, and I'm not asking you to raise your hands, but I would imagine a few of us would raise our hand to say that we can struggle with anxiety. We can be anxious in our time, in our life. George Mueller would say this, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith and the beginning of true faith 
is the end of anxiety. Listen, if we want our faith to increase, it starts with a constant conversation with God, whether that's walking in your neighborhood, whether that's driving down the road with your eyes open, by the way, I shouldn't have to say that, but just in case, whether that's getting on your knees, carrying on a conversation with God, walking and people think you are crazy, that's fine, but we need to have a consistent prayer life. It's a continual contact with God. The prayerful person becomes the faithful person. It's not the other way around. So if we want our faith to increase, it has to be based on prayer. And you might say, Craig, my prayer life is weak. The past is the past. Start anew today. Finish this year strong in your prayer life. Spend some time with the Lord today. Align yourself with his desires. George Mueller was known as a man of great faith. He was known as a man of great prayer. It was not coincidental. They go hand in hand. Once the news of his death went broke, the funeral service was reported all over England. News of his death was sent via wires around the world. The Daily Telegraph wrote that George Mueller, and I quote, had robbed the cruel streets of thousands of victims, the jails of thousands of felons. Then it was asked, how could this be possible? George Mueller told the world that it was a result of prayer. The rationalism rationalism of the day would sneer at that, but the fact would remain in 63 years George Mueller had cared for over 10,000 children. And he would say it was a result of prayer. In his journal, he would say this, every believer is not called upon to establish orphan houses or charity schools. The trust in the Lord for means that all believers are called upon the simple confidence of faith to cast all their burdens upon him to trust in him for everything and not only to make everything a subject of prayer but to expect answers to their petitions which they have asked according to his will in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we want our faith to grow strong, it starts by consistently praying and I wanna encourage you, spend some time talking to the Lord. Spend some time in prayer Make your requests known before the Lord. Number two, living a life of faith requires an understanding of who gets the credit and provides the strength. Living a life of faith requires an understanding of who gets the credit and who provides the strength. To say it another way, living a life of faith requires an understanding that God gets the credit and God provides the strength. Now, some people might say it like this. Living a life of faith requires an understanding that I get the credit and I provide the strength. Or some might say living a life of faith requires an understanding that I get the credit and my job provides the strength or my health provides the strength or my abilities provide the strength or my family provides the strength. Listen, all of those things are good, but they do not get the credit. They do not provide the strength. They will fail you. If your confidence is in anything other than Jesus, it will fail you. And let me make this clear. Your confidence should not be in your grandparents going to church or in Midway Baptist Church. Your confidence should not be in a political party. Your confidence should not be in your job or your retirement. I think many of us have lived a long enough life to know that those things can be taken away in a moment's time. The credit goes to God. Our dependency is on him. Again, if I was to put a chair, a classic example, if I was to set a chair right here and I was to ask you to come and sit in this chair, the majority of us that are walking up here are not thinking to ourselves, well, how 
how does my body work? How do my legs bend? Hope that my arms can do this. I hope my mind is telling. The majority of us are not doing that. What are we doing? We are sitting down in the chair. 100% confidence and dependency on that chair, in that chair, that it's going to hold us up. If we want our faith to increase, 100% dependency is on God. He is the one that will sustain us. He is the one that will carry us. George Mueller said this, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Listen, many of you have experienced seasons in your life, and maybe you're going through that now, where the only thing that you can do is throw your hands up and say, I can't do this on my own ability. I can't do it. I don't have the means financially, or I don't have the ability. I can't force this person to get saved. I can't encourage this child to come back to the Lord. I can't do anything on my own. I am exhausted and I am worn out. I can't face this battle of cancer by myself. I'm exhausted. And my encouragement to you is not to take that lightly, not that it's not a big deal, but to to remind yourself that if you are a child of the king, he is the one that's battling for you. That your dependency is on him that he will provide you the strength to walk through that season that you're in with your health or your finances or your family. There's been times in my life, and I know testimonies of many of you, that can only be explained because of God in his strength and his ability. And if we want our faith to increase, listen, it's through those seasons of life that our faith increases because we see God come through all the time. And again, I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that there's not seasons of difficulty, but I would encourage you that you and I can't do it on our own. We can't. We're going to wear ourselves out. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you've given your life to Jesus, your 100% dependency is on God. Let him fight the battle for you. Hebrews 13, 5 says this, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's one of the great comforting words in the Bible. If you're in that season where you feel like perhaps you are alone, God will not leave you and God will not forsake you. If we want our faith to increase, not only do we spend time In prayer, not only do we remind ourselves that the battle and the strength, all of that is God's, that 100% dependency is on him. But number three is this, living a life, and this is so important, I think we missed this. Living a life of faith requires a long-term view. It is a long, day-by-day process. You might be here this morning and you might say, Craig, I'm not known as a person of faith. I would encourage you that today is day number one. And I would encourage you that it is a day-by-day process, and you're going to stumble, and you're going to fail, but you just keep going. It's a long-term view. Many of you know one of my favorite passages of Scripture, 2 Peter 3, 18 says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. That should be our goal daily. Listen, I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. I want to grow in my faith. I want my faith to be stronger. George Mueller was a great man of faith, but in those early days, you would never have thought that. He struggled in many areas in his life. But he was known as a man of great faith. Listen, your faith is like a muscle. You work that muscle out and it grows stronger. Some of us are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. If I desire to increase my muscle, maybe I'll do that, all right? 
But if you were to do that, that's what would happen. But faith is like a muscle. It continues to grow. And in George Mueller's life, God continued to provide over and over again. Again, early on, we're talking about a man that as a boy stole from his dad. He was in jail. And when it was all said and done, over $163 million came through his hands for the ministry. And when he died, he had very little. All of it went toward the ministry. That did not happen overnight. He did not have an easy life, but he never wavered. He trusted God for his salvation, and he trusted that God would always provide. 1 Peter 1, 7 says this, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire and may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, Peter was one of the disciples who early on in his life was a train wreck. They would argue about who was the greatest. They would make countless mistakes. If you and I saw the training for those three and a half years that Jesus did with them, when Jesus was put on that cross, you and I would say that that training was a colossal failure. And yet those disciples would go on to lead the early church. And the majority, if not all of them, gave their life up for the cause of Christ. It's not an overnight change. It is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. I want to encourage you, if we want to grow in our faith, we just see God come through time and time again. You know, one of the, the great things as we head into Stewardship Month is I hear testimonies of many of you that share early on even giving of your finances and tithing and learning how to tithe and how that was a step of faith. And God continued to provide and increase your faith. It doesn't mean that God always gives material things, but I know so many of you have shared your stories with me of how God just consistently provided He took care of your needs. It increased your faith. you, You grew day by day. When Amanda and I went to be missionaries in Ethiopia, and I I say this hesitantly because we were not very, very long, but I'm just telling you as a finite human that sins, it was it was hard. It was a step of faith. And I'll be as transparent that there were some early days that we were heading out with a 14-month-old baby that I thought to myself, what in the world have I done? Maybe I made a mistake. But I can tell you looking back, without a doubt, that God increased our faith. And I'm so glad that we did it. I'm not here to tell you that it was easy, and I'm not here to tell you that, that, that I had it all figured out because I didn't, but God was gracious and kind with me, and he grew our faith day by day. George Mueller's spiritual life was a constant conflict, but this is what he once said. Now was the trial of faith, but faith triumphed. He said it another way, and I thought this was good. Faith grows with us. We must begin with the little faith that we have, put it to work, faithfully pray, and it will grow stronger day by day. Finally, number four, living a life of faith requires action with an unshakable confidence that God will always provide. Living a life of faith requires action with an unshakable confidence that God will always provide. George Mueller's life was visible proof to the unchangeable faithfulness of the Lord. What a testimony! What a testimony that could be said for you and I that our life was a visible proof of the unchangeable faithfulness of the Lord. Living a life requires action, unshakable confidence God will provide. Listen, knowing faith is having is one thing, putting it to action, to work, that's something different. If you say that you have faith and you don't live that faith out, then there's a disconnect there. Think about it this way. If a man or woman had the license and the training to become a doctor, they had that title, 
but they refused to help anybody. They didn't like people. They didn't want to help anyone. They refused to do medical care on anyone. They might technically have the knowledge, but none of us are calling them doctor. None of us are going to them because they're not putting into action the knowledge that they have. For you and I as believers, if we want to be people of great faith, we have to put that into action. We have to walk step by step and put it into action. I'd encourage you to write this down. This is not on your handout. Faith is technically a noun, but in reality, it is a verb. It is a call to action. Faith is technically a noun, but in reality, it is a verb. It is a call to action. One of the most well-known stories about George Mueller that was told in one of his biographies is this. One time in the orphanage, the children were hungry, but there was no food available Inside the house was 300 children in neat rows standing behind their chairs. In front of them was a plate, a mug, a fork, and a knife. There was no food. God will supply, George would say. So he prayed, dear God, thank you for what you're going to give us to eat. Amen. The children sat down. No sooner, there was a noise in the dining room. They subdued that there was a knock on the door. George walked over there, and outside was a baker. He said, I could not sleep. I just kept sensing that God wanted me to get up and make you bread. So I got up at 2 in the morning, and I made three batches for you. I hope that you can use it. George smiled. God has blessed us through you this morning, he said. Soon a second knock. This time it was from the milkman. He took off his hat and he addressed George. He said, listen, I'm needing a little bit of help. My cart broke down and I need to lighten the load and I have 10 full cans of milk. Could you use that? And George took it in and he gave it to the children. Now listen, I know that most likely that scenario is not going to happen with you and I. I go to the store to get my milk. No one's coming by my my house to deliver my milk, all right? So I, I understand and I get that. But George Mueller lived a life of great faith. He was confident that God was going to consistently provide for him. It was unshakable. It was unwavering. And you and I in our spiritual life, we can live a life like that. We can live a life like that. Listen, if you're here and you're a Christian, you have put your faith and trust in Jesus for your salvation, that you are reconciled before God because of the cross, and your faith is in that, your faith can be that God is going to provide and take care of your needs. The central focus of our faith is confidence in God. It is unshakable trust. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We need to put our faith into action. Beginning of 2024, I just said to myself, I did not want this year to be a wasted year. I did not want to waste this year spiritually. I did not want to waste this year mentally, physically. I didn't want to, I just didn't want it to be a waste. And some of you know what I mean by that. I can look back at years in my life and I can look back and I can say, man, they were just sort of wasted years. Not necessarily that I did anything wrong, not necessarily anything like that but that I could just see where there wasn't as much growth as I wanted. I didn't want to waste it. That was my prayer. And I prayed that prayer a lot this year. And I'll be transparent with you. There's been pockets of of this year where I can look back and I could see sort of went on cruise control, sort of depended on my own ability, my own strength. And I just have pockets that I've wasted. Listen, we have two months left of this year. Let's finish this year strong. Let's increase our faith. Let's grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Listen, if you're here this morning and you're struggling with your faith, listen, you're struggling with trusting the Lord with your family for wisdom that needs to be made, decisions that maybe your adult children are making, a spouse that needs to come to Jesus. You're walking through a season of health difficulties right now, whether that's cancer or something else. 
You're struggling with your finances, with job, trusting the Lord to provide your financial needs, hurt relationships. If you're single and you're trusting the Lord that you want to get married and you're trusting that the Lord will perhaps bring someone into your life, but you're trusting regardless. If you're a couple here and you're wanting to start a family and at this point the Lord has not provided that yet, you're trusting him. Listen, I want to encourage you, keep trusting the Lord. Keep walking in faith. Keep depending on him. Listen, put that faith into action. Keep praying big prayers but keep reminding yourself it is his strength. Reminding yourself that it is a daily process. But keep asking the Lord to make your faith unshakable and unwavering 100%. My confidence is in God. Mark chapter 9 tells a fascinating story about a child that was sick. Verse 17 in Mark 9, then when the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son. He's had a mute spirit. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. So I asked the disciples, and they should cast him out, but they could not. Jesus answered, verse 19, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And it goes on down there. Verse 22, and often he has thrown him both into the fire, into the water to destroy him, but he cannot do anything have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you believe all things are possible to him who believes, immediately the father and child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. This is basically what the man is saying. My faith is far from perfect. If my faith is not enough, increase it. Another way that could be said is this. I believe, help my unbelief. It is a statement of faith, but it is an admission that our faith is far from perfect. <clears throat> Listen, I can tell you in my own life that there have been times that I have cried out and said, Lord, I have the faith that you're in control, but please give me the faith that I need. My faith is far from perfect. And that might be you this morning. Let's finish this year strong in our faith. Let's see our faith increase. Let us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Lord, help me to believe, but if my faith is weak, make it stronger. That's where we want to be. Man, let's set and let's leave a legacy for those after us that we are people of great faith and let's put that into action in our life let's pray every head bowed and every eyes closed very quickly <clears throat> if you're here this morning and you would say craig i could not write anything in that blank i appreciate your honesty i said early on that you have faith in something <clears throat> and so your faith is in something it could be in your family it could be in your grandparents going to church. It could be in your job, retirement, your spouse, your children. But I also made it very, very clear that at some point those things are going to fail. John 3.16 says this, the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's because of God's love for us that Jesus was sent to the cross. That faith that we talk about, there is such thing as a saving faith. Ephesians 2 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, <clears throat> You've never experienced that saving faith. Today could be that day. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that we are sinners. Romans says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
The wages of that sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're here this morning and you never put your faith and trust in Jesus, it's because of the cross, it's because of Jesus, God demonstrated his love toward us that even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. Experience that saving faith today. If that's you, I would encourage you to pray this prayer. It is believing in your heart, confessing your sins, and asking the Lord to forgive you of your sins. It's getting reconciled to God through the work of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to pray this prayer in your heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm confessing to you my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me and I'm putting my faith and trust in you for my salvation. Change my life. If that's you this morning and you meant that in your heart, the Bible says that you are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new is new. That you have experienced that life changing faith. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian and you would say, Craig, I'm struggling in my faith. It's not where I want it to be. Start today new. Spend some time with the Lord today. Confess to him your failures and ask him to increase your faith. If you're walking in a season right now, whether personally or family, and your hands are just thrown in the air because you don't know what to do, keep trusting the Lord. You keep praying, and you keep walking in faith. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. And so, Father, I just pray. So often our weak faith, Lord, increase our faith. Help us to trust you. Help us to walk in faith with our families, with our own lives, with our finances, with the relationships that have been severed. Father, I just pray that we would keep walking in faith. Help us not to give up. So Father, I just pray right now for strength. I pray, Lord, for grace. And I just pray that we will walk confidently in you. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.